Welcome everyone to what I know is going to be a really, really exciting session. There's a couple of things I just want you to note before we start. And that is uh, number one, this is divided into two. So there are two sessions on adolescence. And this one is going to be with Lottie and Anna, and they are going to talk about coping with COVID-19, supporting adolescents and their parents, caregivers, during the COVID-19 pandemic with Plan International. And the second thing I just wanna note for you is please put your cameras on. Even if you're not sure about that, it's just so much easier if we can talk to a person face-to-face -face and have those type of conversations. So with those two things down, so you know come to session one and then the next one come to session two in uh, session 17. I'm going to turn it over to Lottie and Anna, and they're going to take us into some really interesting information. All right, thank you so much, Judy. Um, my name is Lotte. I work with Plan International, uh, mainly working on uh, strengthening our humanitarian uh, work for adolescents in emergencies. Um, and with me, I have Anna as well. Hello, good afternoon. So my name is Anna Belt. I'm also working for Plan International but in the Netherlands. And yeah, I'm very happy to be here today. So let me start, <laughs> maybe, yeah. Let me start with a, with a short presentation uh, about coping with COVID-19. Uh, so as we just said before, so this is a, a global program from Plan International uh, to support adolescents, parents, and caregivers to stay healthy and protected during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, sorry. Um, so you might wonder why do we focus on adolescents? Um, from our research and program evidence, we know that adolescents face specific risk, have specific needs and resources, while they're often an overlooked group in any crisis situation. Looking at the specific COVID-19 uh, crisis, we know that the school closure will affect children and especially adolescents because they're more likely to drop out from school and even more on a permanent basis because they, they have maybe to support their parents um, or work. We also know that COVID-19 is limiting the opportunities to see friends, peers, have social interaction, which is again, very important for adolescents for their development and well-being. Um, the pandemic is also uh, limiting the access to health services, including uh, mental health and uh, SRHR which again, has a high impact on adolescents. And like in any crisis, uh, there are also a rise in the protection risk. So especially because the adolescents are staying at home, um, there is a higher risk for parental stress, for um, family violence, for family separations, uh, also to be forced into child labor or to be exposed to online exploitation. And as you might know, adolescent girls uh, are the most at risk and they have specific risk and especially also in this COVID-19 crisis. Um, as you all know, there are many reports of sexual and gender-based violence. There is also a uh, likelihood increase for child marriage as a result of the economic crisis. Uh, what we also know from previous uh, epidemics uh, like Ebola is that um, the rise of sexual violence and um, the fact that they have less access to, um, to SRHR uh, has led to spikes in teenage pregnancy. Um, then also, um, girls are typically more restricted in their movement and have less access to means of communication, which also means that they are at higher risk of social isolation and have a lower access to services and support. So this all led us to develop the coping with COVID-19 package. So what does the, COVID, the coping with COVID-19 package do? What are the objectives? So um, the aim is to promote the well-being of at-risk adolescents by providing age-appropriate information on COVID-19. So reliable, but not overwhelming information, focusing on what they can do uh, to help themselves and the others. It also provides ways for adolescents to develop positive coping strategies, stay self, safe, <laughs> access sexual and reproductive health and rights, and learn at home. 
It also provides a space to discuss and address myth and stigma related to COVID-19. It also provides tips for parents, caregivers of adolescents to practice self-care and positive parenting. And it also um, creates the opportunities to raise awareness and to link the participants to available services. Um, what, is, what is the package or so the content of this package? You have six sessions for adolescents who are looking at the age of 10 to 19 years old. Uh, six parenting sessions for parents and caregivers of adolescents. An implementation guide with resources for the facilitator, handouts for the participants and MNE tools. There is as well an additional ECD parenting program, um, which can also be very helpful if, uh, for the um, young caregivers. Um, maybe also something interesting to say is um, the main sources that we use to develop this package are the Plan International Global Adolescents in Crisis Life Skills and Parenting Program, which is not out yet, but very soon. Um, the evidence-based parenting tips from Parenting for Lifelong Health, uh, the global COVID-19 messages, resources, and infographics from WHO and UNICEF. And for the ECD uh, curriculum, we use the um, evidence-based parenting under pressure uh, package from Plan International Australia. Um, one more slide that I would like to show you is um, this one where you can see um, uh, below on the left side, the outline of the sessions for the adolescents and on top the outline of the sessions for parents of adolescents. So here you can see, I mean, uh, the same, the, the themes that we developed already before uh, in the slide on the objectives. Uh, it's all about um, how to uh, manage stress, psychosocial support, about protection, health, SRHR, education. What you can also see is that the, um, the topics of the sessions are very similar between the adolescents and the parents. This because uh, yeah, we would like that the parents and the adolescents have the same knowledge and that the good practices are reinforced at home. Um, then uh, this package was developed for face-to-face -face facilitation uh, with small groups of participants. We are looking at uh, five to 10 participants. Uh, this to allow social distancing and other COVID-19 mitigation measures. Um, we advise as well to limit the age range between the participants. Um, so for example, to group the younger ones and um, aside then the older ones, not all together, just so that you can also, it's easier also to, to have adapted content. Uh, we also suggest to contextualize the content to the context. Um, and situation. Uh, every session would last for about 45 minutes, so it's a bit sh it's short. Um, but we use participatory approaches and gender and age and culturally adapted creative methodology. Um, so this is to make sure that the key messages are well understood and also that the life saving skills are really well um, integrated by the participants. And maybe this is maybe something to say as well. I mean, when it comes to the creative methodology, uh, we were very lucky to have started a partnership with Clowns of Borders for our life skills and parenting program. And so we developed like, um, we developed and tested like 100 games and creative exercises to be used with the adolescents. And um, so this is the manual that you see uh, also here the laughter and play manual. And so we use some of the games in our sessions. And maybe last thing to say about this slide is that, so yeah, it was developed for face-to-face -face, uh, facilitation, but it's also very possible to adapt it for online uh, sessions. So now I give it over to Lotte <laughs> for maybe a bit more about uh, how it was implemented and uh, some results about that. Thank you, Anna. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, yeah, so actually, um, I regret that we don't have a colleague here um, in the session uh, who is actually, as a frontline worker, uh, implemented this session. Um, 
instead we were actually we are hoping to uh, use your expertise uh, the expertise and experience that we have in the room um, before we uh, we do some group work um, i just wanted to highlight a little bit how the implementation of this package has gone and kind of yeah bring the, the voices of the colleagues in the countries um, more to the forefront um, this package has taken off quite quickly. Uh, since April 2020, uh, the package has been introduced uh, in, in more than 20 countries worldwide. Um, we have been able to train our staff mostly remotely through webinars um, and often directly with the frontline facilitators, which included plan staff as well as uh, implementing partners. And in most cases, that online training was coupled or follow up uh, followed up with an in-country face-to-face uh, training as well as contextualization and uh, translation. Um, the package is available in multiple languages so if you are interested in, um, in accessing it you can uh, contact us after the session. Um, and in July, four months into the implementation of this package, we decided to undertake a real-time evaluation to see how the implementation was going and to also gather feedback from our countries, uh, uh, from our country teams. Um, and they also collected feedback from the participants in the session. So this way, um, we, we got a fairly good idea about the successes and the challenges. Um, and we would like to just highlight a couple of those uh, here today. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we got feedback from nine country offices um, and this, um, uh, yeah, the sessions were of course a lighter version uh, compared to our regular life skills and parenting packages um, and participants and uh, facilitators really felt that they were easy to use, very interactive um, and fun. Uh, both the facilitators and the participants observed that the sessions and the fact that we worked together at the same time with adolescents and the parents in uh, separate sessions that it really helped promote this connectedness and trust between adolescents and their parents during this uh, difficult time. So that was something they regarded as, as really positive. Um, they also um, appreciated the fact that we, that we were able to talk about some of these myths and misconceptions about COVID-19 and that it also helped kind of change people's minds about how to deal with the situation. Um, and we also saw some really interesting innovations where some of our teams in countries uh, used the messages more for their audio or television broadcasting um, or uh, were able to implement sessions more remotely. And I will come back to that in a little bit. Um, going to the next slides. Thank you. Um, we actually wanted to uh, share a couple of uh, challenges with you, but really bring it to the table um, uh, for discussion with you because we hope that you know with the expertise that we have in the room um, we are able to to maybe learn also from good practices from others. Um, there's three challenges that we identified during the evaluation that we would like to uh, discuss with you. Um, and the first one will be this, the, discussed in breakout uh, room one which is about this idea of myths and misconception about COVID-19. Uh, Judy will be uh, uh, um, facilitating the discussion um, and she will uh, ask you the question, how can we tackle the myths, misconceptions and fake information about COVID-19 uh, that, that we see sometimes um, and how can we do that effectively with the adolescents and their caregivers? Um, in room two, uh, I will be uh, facilitating a discussion on how we can use technology to reach adolescents. Um, I will start the conversation by introducing an innovative approach that we uh, used in Lebanon and Jordan, which had its huge successes, but also challenges. Um, so we would love to hear from you what your experiences were um, in using technology to better reach um, adolescents during COVID-19. And in room three, Anna will discuss uh, with you how we can best do remote capacity building. So she will start the discussion by introducing some challenges that we faced in this project um, when providing technical support and training to our facilitators if we were not able, in, in situations where we were not able to uh, work face to face with them. And we would love to also hear uh, your challenges and successes in dealing with that situation. 
So my understanding is that we are automatically going to be uh, assigned to rooms. Uh, so unfortunately, there's not that much uh, space to, to choose. Um, but we're really looking forward to continuing uh, this discussion with you in smaller groups. Um, we will be using a Jamboard and um, we will give you instructions in the, in the room itself. Uh, we'll do that for about 20 minutes and then we come back to the plenary uh, for the main takeaways. So I, I'm not sure if uh, uh, Max, you want to say something? Oh, I think we're going. <laughs> I've opened right. up rooms now. If you uh, click, click to join, it'll send you to. All right. Um, Max, will you pull up the, um, the three jam boards one by one? Oh, I think you are on mute. Yeah, sure. I'll just do that now. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, starting with number one, probably. Okay, so that's our jam board. If that's what it looks like, we don't have much on it, but we definitely had <laughs> we definitely had a good discussion. We spent more time talking than putting on jam board. So um, basically. Uh, Later. Okay, so basically there are the, the myths were the myths about misinformation, about not thinking that COVID-19 was going to hit them, um, that it was mainly for older people and people with health conditions. And um, in, in Iraq, it was a, one of the big problems was actually meeting, meeting with or having contact with the girl child. Uh, they could have lots of contact with boys because they were on the internet, but girls did not, weren't, didn't have the devices, weren't on the internet. And then there was how do we really uh, become, be, change behaviors and how do we build on um, what the kids could know and apply to. So uh, some of the suggestions, and people can correct me if I'm wrong, is with uh, working around whether the girls got the information was using radio and TV um, and showing them how the disease does apply to young people and how that their behavior, like wearing masks, etc., can, oh, really happen. So here we have, we do have more up on our, our jam board than what that first one that Max showed us. So it's changing the message and also being aware who the messenger is, who, who can actually speak and who the kids will listen to were really critical points. Okay, I'll just turn to my group. If there was any, anything that I missed that they think really needs to be um, emphasized. Okay, I guess we could go to group two then. All right, that's me. Uh, yeah, as you can see, actually we had a really great conversation with many different uh, examples. Um, so the question we started off with was, uh, what are effective ways to use technology in reaching adolescents? Um, there were quite a lot of um, different um, examples given of um, technology being used. For example, uh, virtual Facebook pages for peer-to-peer -peer, uh, education and mentoring between um, adolescents. Uh, similarly, there was also an example of uh, a youth leaders group that uh, was really trained. Uh, they were trained as researchers. So during the pandemic, uh, the youth researchers actually gathered data with their peers and only with um, adults as their supervisors or, or ad um, advisors. Um, UNICEF in Bangladesh uh, used uh, creative, um, sorry, created digital platforms um, that were scaled up during the pandemic, also connecting adolescents uh, with each other. So this way, more than 5,000 adolescents were uh, supported and reached with um, COVID-19 and, and protection-related information. Um, if I would highlight one main challenge that was sort of came through all these examples was, of course, the exclusion of those who do not have access to internet or to 
a mobile device to uh, receive uh, calls or, or connect to the internet with. So um, that was actually a really, really sort of a key challenge. Uh, there was a really great example from uh, World Vision. Um, and uh, they said, well, actually we have um, uh, handed out devices to adolescents and we have actually installed certain apps so that they can continue to learn and access information. Um, and yeah, so maybe the bottom line is if we are able to connect uh, adolescents, um, it's a super powerful tool to reach them and, and connect them and share information. But then we have to overcome the fact that some uh, do not have that access in the first place. Um, I'll stop there um, and move quickly to Anna. So for us, I mean, yeah, we also had a very, yeah, very interesting discussions and uh, a few also, yeah, challenges, but also some good practices or suggestions. Maybe um, I would highlight those more, um, especially work like, for example, uh, when we're discussing more uh, sensitive topics or new topics, it would be very, it's very important to be culturally sensitive. And maybe a good idea would be peer-to-peer -peer learning. So encouraging uh, uh, that, yeah, colleagues from different countries try to, um, so that the capacity building is not always done just by uh, people from, from Europe, let's say, but uh, more also um, in the same region. And then also, uh, we also said like, yeah, the, it might be also interesting to use different medias. So videos, posters, um, yeah, videos. I heard a lot about videos, mock as well uh, for, um, uh, so that they can learn on their own. Um, what else? Um, study guides as well, so that you can also continue learning while, um, while facilitating. Um, I think that was, I think, uh, did I miss anything? Yeah, using phones, not just internet, but also phones directly. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know, people from the group, is there anything that I miss? I, I, I see something, somebody must have written it in, uh, the use of role plays and case studies and storytelling. I think that's, um, mm. that's an interesting one too, yeah. Storytelling. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Excellent. Okay, yeah. Wow. The person didn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Let's see how that could be. Um, yeah. So, also, I think there it's, it's challenging, but there are also some ways of uh, of uh, yeah managing to do some good capacity building. Excellent. Okay. Thank you so much for your fantastic participation and really rapid input during these uh, discussions. Uh, I'm sure we have a lot to sort of take away from this session. Um, I'm sure there may be questions about this package, how we implemented it, uh, lessons learned, translations, etc. Uh, really feel free to connect with Anna and me um, if you have questions uh, about this package or um, our experiences. Uh, also, feel free to get in touch if you have um, any great uh, tips for us, of course. So, um, yeah, we um, with this, uh, thank you so much and um, hopefully see you in the next session. Yeah, so thank you very, very much. In five minutes, the second part of the sessions on adolescence starts. So please continue and join with us and uh, keep track of how you can get in touch with both Anna in Lottie. Okay, until Judy, next Judy. session. Thanks, Max. Judy, I think it's actually now that we start. We were, we're good. Were meant, I think we were meant to finish. Just okay. So, Hani, you're saying we're we're meant to just move right into the next one? Yeah, I think the end end of the previous session was five minutes ago, and there was only okay. minutes in between. Okay, so. Maybe, maybe take a I'll minute. Just, okay, take yeah. a minute. Take a deep breath. Stand up. Uh, shake your hands. Um, and then we can go right into the next one. And I see we have our next presenters ready. So I just want to make Kareen is here. Riyadh is here. And Dipesh was in the last session. So 
he's here. So let's move in. So this is great. We can just continue to build on what we've already learned in our first session. And so in this session, we have two really significant um, topics. One is between war and pandemic, activating the agency of Syrian teens through a participatory study of resources and needs with Syr Syrian Child Protection Network called the HURAS. And the other one is building resilience of children and young people during COVID-19 with World Vision. And we have three uh, great uh, presenters and we will move again into dialogue about this. We have Kareen and we have Rihad and we have Depeche. And I'm going to let them take over and introduce themselves and move into their session. Thank you very much. So, uh, should I start or do you want yes. to start? Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Introduce, introduce yourself, Riyad. And, uh. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Riyad. I am a, uh, the CEO and co-founder of uh, Haras. Uh, Haras, it's an Arabic name. It means guardians in English. And um, we are dedicated to do child protection. We are a Syrian NGO. Um, and we've been um, doing child protection work since 2012. Um, Judy, should I continue with the presentation or first introduction? Uh, why don't you uh, continue with your presentation and everybody can introduce themselves as they start their presentation. So you're on screen, so just sure. continue. <clears throat> sure. So I, I won't have any slides today. Uh, I thought it would be like a bit fun to like have some kind of a discussion together. <clears throat> Um, and as I realize, I don't have enough time to go through everything uh, we have in our study. I hope that you all had the chance to uh, watch our video on uh, the Alliance uh, channel, YouTube channel. If not, I will make sure to post it uh, uh, in the uh, um, comments uh, later today or later uh, during the session. Um, because it has like much, uh, so much like more details than I will be able to, to, to share today. Um, so um, basically what we've done, we've partnered up with uh, Hunter University to test a participatory uh, tool that aims to include communities in the determination of uh, priorities during the humanitarian response. And we decided to focus on uh, adolescents as uh, COVID-19 had uh, a big impact on our mobility. So basically uh, what we've done is instead of uh, saying, hello, we're here to help. What we've said was, hey, uh, what's up? Let's talk, tell us what's going on. Um, and uh, 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 let's, let us know how we can help. Um, uh, so what we've done is we've gathered a, a group of uh, adolescents around uh, 43 uh, uh, young people and uh, we asked them to, to answer uh, those uh, questions. The first one was, what are the biggest three problems in your community? Then uh, who should solve them and how should they be solved? And the last question was, um, what can you as a young person do? So um, we got answers in, in three groups. Of course, we wanted to have uh, uh, like face-to-face -face meetings to use whiteboards, uh, flip charts, and other like uh, interactive uh, uh, methodologies. But unfortunately with the COVID-19, we couldn't do that. And we ended up using a uh, online survey and uh, like uh, some like e-meetings uh, with the group. So we got answers uh, in through groups, um, COVID-19 related responses, also responses that are related to growing up uh, in, in conflict or under conflict. And the last group was uh, like um, uh, personal problems. What was great, um, about this uh, was not the, the answers themselves, but the interaction we got uh, um, from uh, the, the participants uh, and we, how we understood like, that they, they have so much hunger to participate and to do more to their communities. 
um, this is um, uh, not only important for, for the response itself, but it's also important for their development. After that, uh, we, invite, we invited them to, uh, to a new meeting where we said, um, so this is what we've got from you. Do you think that those are still the, the priorities or, or do you think like something came up during like uh, the, the, the last uh, time since we last met? Let's discuss and let's uh, prioritize them from like the most important to the least. Um, and as this study is, or this like project is still uh, going on, it's not finalized then. Uh, uh, yet um, the next step would be uh, to 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 ask them what's what can we do about those uh, topics? What can we do about your uh, uh, priorities? And um, then um, as a group, a young group, we will see what they can do in their communities. And we, as an NGO, will try our best to. Uh, allocate resources to help them uh, implement uh, uh, whatever initiative they they, they end up uh, uh, doing. Um, it's worth uh, to, to mention here that uh, by using such met methodologies in our uh, context before, um, uh, this led to uh, the formation of a youth network on uh, the governorate level uh, that was able to implement uh, 22 community-based uh, and youth-led initiatives uh, that has a, a positive impact on um, uh, around 4,300 uh, children and over 100, uh, sorry, over 1,200 uh, families. Um, this is what I'm going to share today and I look forward to uh, like a richer discussion during the breakout uh, uh, rooms. Back to you, Rudy. Thank you so Hi. much. Hi, thank you so much, Rihad. How wonderful that those children, those youth became so involved and of course they want to be involved. That's great. So Kareen, I now will turn that over to you to introduce your, your topic uh, with you and Deepesh. Yeah, I think like Deepesh, you said like you will start sure. first. Yeah. <laughs> sure, Karen. Hello, everyone. And we would like to make it as interactive as possible. My name is Deepesh Paul Thakur. I'm the director for Local to Global Advocacy and Impact, working for World Vision International. Karen. So I'm Karin, I'm Senior Policy Advisor, uh, and I'm leading on the It Takes a World campaign like to end violence against children. But I got another hat, and it's about child participation when we do research for World Vision UK. So I think like uh, if uh, Max, can you put like the slide number two? I think we, oh, yeah. Because what we want to do like uh, today is kind of uh, to make it like uh, interactive. So we got like four questions. So like uh, Deepesh, what do you want to, uh, to introduce yes. first? Sure. So basically, we will be asking each another questions so that you understand what we are talking about. And the first question is for myself, Karen, you know, yes, to, so, uh, to answer. Yes, to <laughs> and, uh, yeah. yes. So we, we want to know, like, why did we decide to conduct like a consultation with children and young people during like, COVID-19? Yes, uh, basically, World Vision has been working with children and communities trying to bring about, you know, contribute towards the well being of children since more than 17 years. And in this journey, we have realized the importance of listening to children. And, and, and every time we do so, we are really fascinated with the perspective, the innovative ideas they bring on the table. Uh, we as an organization are also advocating that no child should be left behind. And as an international uh, you know, advocacy relief and development organization, we are committed to the implementation of various international conventions, such as the Convention on Human Rights or the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which calls not only for us, but also for the larger society to listen to children. But the, given the context of COVID, this was more important for us to see that how we listen to these children despite all the odds, despite all the challenges. And we knew that children are spending more time at home 
We also knew while listening to the communities from various sources that the children are at risk, risk of isolation, risk of witnessing violence, experiencing violence within their home. And that was one of the reasons we wanted to consult children worldwide in six regions, more than 40 countries. And we are about to share with you the results of consulting more than 800 children around the world. With this, Karen, you also have read the report with great interest, isn't it? Uh, yes. So tell us, uh, what, what, what are some of the you know, things that children and young people are telling us from this consultation? Yeah, thank you, Deepesh. So ideally, like, we would like to have like, young people like, in, with us like, in this presentation. But uh, we don't have, but we will represent them. And to, we say, like, OK, let's get like, their voice like, uh, with, uh, with us. So what they tell, tell them? about poverty and violence. So Emily, she is like 17, she's from Uganda. And she said like poverty during this period has led to unwanted pregnancy, domestic violence and child abuse. And that because of children are not in school. They mentioned about child labor and this one is from like Miradi, 15 years old from DRC. She said like, especially since there is no more school, the parent takes the opportunity to send and give heavy work to their children. The fact that today parents no longer work as before forces some children to contribute to family survival, for example, by selling water, and this exposes them to risks such as traffic, accident rate, etc. And I want just like to emphasize what children and young people say about like children and young people uh, participation. So Arnold is like 17 years old, he's from DRC, and he says the participation of children is a right. It's not a favor, and COVID-19 affect our life. And Easter, as well, 17 years old from DRC, he says the government and other actors, NGO and UN, must involve children and ensure that the protection of the child is always respected by the times that the country goes through. So as you see, it's just like a sample of what children say, but you can see about like the, the, the conviction like they want uh, to tell us and want to share with with us. So now, like Deepesh, can you uh, tell, uh, tell us like, uh, what are the challenges when we do like the consultation with children and young people? Yes, it was, if it is a normal situation, the numbers would have been more than thousands and thousands, you know. Uh, this was a qualitative research. And despite the desire to reach as much as many of children, which were, we were confined to, uh, our desire was also to see that as much as possible, we are inclusive in the, doing this research with respect to including various forms of issues uh, with respect to caste, gender, disability, et cetera. And we tried our best to do it, but in a normal situation that would have been much more better. We also realize that many of the children who are impacted with respect to the after aftershocks of COVID-19, they live in fragile contexts vulnerable places where they don't have access to information, so forth and so on. And they are impacted by multiple levels of vulnerability. Not necessarily did we were able to reach out to those children as well. But another one interesting issue is, you know, reaching children online, many of them might have felt being watched, you know, by parents. And it may be a hindrance in terms of them expressing what they have felt. It, it, may, it might not have come out explicitly as such. So those were some of the challenges uh, that, that we witnessed during this consultation. Nevertheless, there are some interesting findings uh, which, which are there. But more importantly, what do we learn? And Karen, let us know, you know, what are the key steps uh, next to this consultation? Uh, how are we are moving forward? Yeah, so I think like the first thing is what we, we learn is that children and young people are ready and willing to play their part in fighting the spread of COVID-19. So we know like children are resilient, they go through different issues, but they want to have a say, to contribute and to solve this pandemic. Another thing it's like uh, we need to recognize and embrace like children and young people as right older and social actors mm -hmm. with capability to contribute like to stop like the spread of COVID-19. But for that, like we need to include like appropriate like strategy to ensure that their participation is safe, sensitive and meaningful. And we need to provide as well like age appropriate information. The third learning, it's about like children are not simple recipients. 
they are active participants. So we need to involve them from the beginning of our discussion. So children need to be at the center of our discussion. They are part of the, the solution and for us, like their voice matter. And last point, it's about like what next? And HACNO is the name of the report that will be like published at the end of October with the finding of the con consultation. So we will invite like children and young people part of the research at the virtual table with like decision maker and relevant like stakeholders at local, national, regional and global level to discuss like the finding. So what do we want? We want like a collaborative participation between children and adults. After the consultation, we go with the collaborative participation. And I think like is the key point, it's so important. So we know like we have like a biggest challenge like uh, coming like ahead of us is to make sure like this voice of children and young people are taking into account. Right. And decision maker and relevant like stakeholder like take action. So it's our biggest like challenge, but like uh, we are going for that. Yeah. We are indeed. Yes. So you'll be sharing about the breakout room now, Karen, isn't it? Uh, I think like first, like we have like a question like to ask to the audience. So I think Max, yes, uh, yes. can you put in the chat? So I think it's there, no? Uh, so you just need to go on the link, then click on. Coming. Yes, and the first can. question is like, what is your preference on, ch on children and adolescent participation? Is it consultative? Is it collaborative or it's a child-led participation? So we got like three questions. So I think after like... Uh... Ooh, the child-led is winning. It should be child-led, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Collaborative and child-led, yes, yeah. the way to go. Uh, for the second question, like uh, Max, do we need to uh, to click again on the? Yes. No. no. So we put in the first one. Now the Max is putting in the second one. Yeah. Sorry about that. I just had a little bit of difficulty with my technology. Just bear with me for, for one minute. Yeah. And I will uh, send that through. Yeah, and it is really interesting whether it should be child-led or it should be adult-led, you know, and it depends entirely on the context of where the children are, which defines how we would like them to participate. Uh, but of course, the desire is we've seen many child-led movements being successful as well. Next. Yeah, Max, you can tell us when it's ready or uh, maybe it's mine. If you... Yeah. I'm uh, just loading it up now. Apologies. No, it's okay. <laughs> so here's yeah. the link uh, to go to the second question. It's actually the same link, but it takes you there all the same. Yeah, so quick, quick one. So do children and adolescents need to be part of policy making on issues that matter to them? You just say yes or no. Yes. <laughs> it's so easy to convince this crowd, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we got like a last question. <laughs> so maybe like this one, like... Uh... And the last question is about like benefits of including children and adolescent voice in our, more, in our work. And if you can just like put some word. We need really like to see what is the benefit. So it will give us like as well like the motivation to include their voice. Yes, more relevant program. They know the best what they need. They are empowered, they are right holders. 
you know, so many good things, positive changes, unique perspective. And I, I, you know, I've worked in field and I've been fascinated of how unique their perspective is, which is so different from adults as well. Uh, yeah. Good. That's great. Yeah. yeah. I think it's time to go for the breakout discussion. Thank and you so much for everyone's participation in this yeah. one. <laughs> Yeah, we wanted to make it a bit like interactive, but you will have more space now to discuss. So you will go like in, in group and uh, we will ask you like three questions. You will get like 15 minutes to answer. Uh, I just said like the first question is, as a child protection like uh, professional in humanitarian context, what are your obstacles for not including children and adolescent voice in your work? The second question is, how do you think like children and adolescents in your part of the world like will answer this question uh, differently? And at the end is, what are the solutions like to include children and adolescent events in our work? So we got like 15 minutes, we got like the breaking room and we'll come back at the end uh, with some feedback. Yeah, so, so just to clarify for the second question, uh, like um, the questions are the one that have been asked in uh, the uh, uh, study. I'm not doing so very well. At... <laughs> so I'm going to get the food bank. I will paste the questions here in, uh, in the chat. So uh, maybe you can like, uh, I, I, we had like question uh, answers from Syria, maybe you can imagine how adolescents and children in your community would answer those questions. Excellent. So Max, now you're going to put everybody into rooms. So rooms are now open. If you click the join link, that'll take you in there. See you in 15 minutes. Okay, so I, I think um, I think that this group with uh, Kareen now is there was going to be a quick report back from each of the groups. So Ria, do you want to take off on that? Yeah, sure. Like we had a um, great conversation. Um, it's like different views from like around the world. Um, so uh, we only had time to discuss like uh, two uh, questions. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, let me find it. Um, yeah, so for, for the risks, uh, uh, sorry, for uh, obstacles to engage uh, uh, children and uh, adolescents in, in, in our work, like uh, uh, we started with risks uh, that, that may be associated to, to, to the children if we engage them, especially when, uh, when you work uh, in, in a conflict. Uh, like some political risks when you have two parties uh, uh, like fighting uh, children when, when they express themselves with the language they use, they may be like interpreted in, in any way um, a party wants. So we may be putting them and their families in, in risks. Another thing is um, uh, um, adults are, are not giving like values to, to, to uh, young uh, children and, and adolescents. Uh, they, they don't believe they, they can like uh, add and value to, to, uh, to what we do. Uh, and at the end of the day, they are the, uh, those who have the money, they, they control what, what happens though uh, when they don't believe uh, uh, in, in the youth and their participation, uh, they don't uh, uh, support them to do that. Um, uh, another thing is like the role that um, uh, adolescents may, may take in, in the uh, household when they support their families and uh, uh, do, do the work in, in, uh, in the family to, to provide may make it uh, like a bit uh, uh, hard to, to, uh, to get them to, to, to engage with us. Um, um, we also discussed like what uh, like big problems may uh, uh, youth and children uh, have in their communities. How would they express those uh, those problems? Um, and and this was like really a great conversation. But what we uh, can take out of it is uh, like um, it's it's important to see how like the context. Uh, um, would affect what are the, the, the priorities. And we see that around the world. 
uh, usually like in the, in the similar context, you would see like same priorities and same problems. Um, and I think that would be like uh, a great opportunity for us, like uh, responders, practitioners to, to, to learn, to always like uh, look to the host history, uh, other context, uh, learnings from, from other contexts, so we can like apply them in, in our um, uh, uh, work. Um, I don't want to take much, and I know we don't have the time, uh, so maybe we, we uh, move to the next group. Okay, great. So uh, who's speaking for the next group? I can do uh, quickly. So uh, we have an uh, interesting, like as well, like a uh, conversation obstacle, like, you know, like for, uh, for participation, it's like, it was really like about like internet access, uh, access like to uh, like the village, like it's something important. And as well, it's about like the perception of the community. They are not like ready like to listen like children and young people, and especially at this time with COVID-19, uh, like participants say like first it's about food, so like to give like space for children like to talk like uh, it's come later. So it's like it's about the context about like obstacle. So now it's about like solution what we can what we can do. So we say like. Uh, uh, to do like some home visit because like we know like it was context like in Yemen like it's not easy like in conflict areas so we need to start like slowly and we say like okay let's go to home visit talk to the parents and you can reach the children and create like this uh, relationship. Uh, we can as well have like a complaint box like uh, in the school uh, for especially for the girl like to be able like to express themselves because in some country like girls are not able to talk to adults so let's start as well like small but giving them like this opportunity and as well to have like the staff going like uh, with like the emergency team like when they go to the field when they go to the family and to talk about child protection but as well about child participation so as well it's to go like, slowly uh, but like to bring like this child participation, the view of the child like, to the parents, to the community. Uh, yeah, but it's still like a long way to go. But uh, yeah, we, yeah, it was really good uh, in interactions and we know we need to start like slowly. Okay, thank you, Karina. We're, I'm looking at the time and I think that we're just about have to wrap up and can't get the feedback from the last one. Um, that I'm right on that, right, Max? We're over our time. Is it okay or can we just have like little like because I think it's important like to get deeper. Can we have really can quick. We one really quick depression? Yes, yeah, I'll be very quick. With respect to obstacles, the issue of mindset with adults came in very prominently. The pressure of time, you know, came up very <laughs> You know, you need to get things done. But the most important one also, how it is challenging to make children's participation meaningful was another one which came very prominently. The solution, I'll just say, you know, one of the colleagues shared about the research she's doing with the young child. And it came evidently in our research too. Young people, children saying, give us the credit, give us the space, uh, we can uh. contribute. And I think that's where I would just like to end the note with a, uh, with the, you know, a particular quote from Arnold, a, a boy from DRC, who says that child participation, the participation of children is a right and not a favor. And COVID-19 affects our lives too. Thank you. That is a great quote to finish with. Thank you so much. Again, read the background paper. It's all about this and all about the questions we need to ask. Thank you for joining us for a session that we just want to keep talking about because this is so important. Um, so please, you need to make your way back to the plenary space on um, Kiko Chat. And don't forget to leave this Zoom room, then join the plenary in the Kiko Chat and click the green button to join the Zoom meeting there. And Hani also says that there's going to be a donor practitioner social happening after the wrap up session. So uh, that's why we have to sort of move things a bit quicker. So go to plenary, have fun. Thank you for so much of your conversation and continue talking this way. Continue moving this forward. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye.